Wars on, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Ross. I like games. And today, I would like to take a little bit of a look at the best house combination from Age of Ascension. The other day, I showed you Call of the Archons, the very first ever Keyforge expansion, and we looked at what the very best house combination was. We didn't have time in this video to have a look at Age of Ascension, but firstly, I'd like to go through for completeness sake, and secondly, this was actually launched at the Birmingham Vault Tour where I was casting and playing all weekend, and it was a lovely time, and frankly, I have a big soft spot for this expansion. Shout out once again to the crucibletracker.com who have gone and been lovely and provided the information for us. And what we see with Age of Ascension is not quite the same level of consistency that we see in Call of the Archons. You see, in Call of the Archons, number one was Dis Shadows Untamed. Number two was Dis Shadows Logos. And then number three was Logo Shadows Untamed. We don't see that same level of consistency in Age of Ascension. Now, to be fair, number one and two both have Dis and both have Logos. But number one has Shadows and number two has Mars. But we don't then see... Shadows, Logos, Mars, Sanctum comes in at number 3, and Untamed comes in at number 4, and Brobnar comes in at number 5. That is to say that unlike in Call of the Archons, there is a really definite top 3 houses, at least in terms of the combo, whereas Call of the Archons, we did have to have a chat about 4. And if we look at the win rate, we got a 52.88% win rate, and the next highest is 48.82. There is a big jump between number one and number two. So let's start off talking about shadows then, because frankly, ladies and gentlemen, it's shadows, right? We know how good shadows are. We know that shadows are the house with amber control, and we know how important amber control is in terms of winning. You stop your opponent forging keys. And some old favorites from Call of the Archons are back. Miasma. Yep. That one that literally just says, your opponent cannot forge a key. Well, they skip their forging a key turn. That's pretty huge. And of course, too much to protect is also back. The one where you steal all but six of their amber. But then there are new cards like Swindle. Swindle is both an alpha and omega card. The only one we've seen so far. Which means it's the only thing you get to do on your turn. But you steal free amber. So you know what? It's totally worth it. We've got new cards like Ronnie Wrist Clocks. When you play him down, you steal an Amber. If your opponent has seven or more Amber, you get to steal two instead. And who can forget about Brend the Fanatic? Brend the Fanatic, when you play it, your opponent gains an Amber, which sounds really good. But when it's destroyed, you steal free Amber. Yeah, that, that, that's going to make a bit of a difference. Routine job is very much back. That's the one whereby you steal an amber, but then if you've got one in your discard, you steal one more amber for each one in your discard. Yancey Gang comes along with a skill, an action that steals an amber, and it just keeps going. I mean, Gamgee steals an amber when you reap, as long as your opponent's got more amber than you. The thing is, they've tried to add a few more tricks in Age of Ascension. Plague Rats are fun, but unfortunately never really set the world on fire. Really fun creatures, not that great. And we did actually get Nightforge, a second key cheating card after Key of Darkness. But neither of those have proven to be particularly amazing in terms of extra key forging, key charge, and key abduction, we generally see working far more often. Now, there's still quite a lot of cheeky damage in Shadows. Life for a Life was one of the really cool new cards that came around here, whereby you sacrificed a creature of yours to deal six damage to a creature, probably of your opponents, but you could actually do it to Bren the Fanatic, which would be hilarious. We still had Nerve Blast that stole some amber, and then did some cheeky damage. But we got things like whistling darts and throwing stars, which again, really good cheeky damage cards. Shadow's still very much the kings of Keyforge, even in Age of Ascension. And then we saw Dis. 
And honestly, in Age of Ascension, this just carried on doing what they were doing. Whereas Houses Like Shadows added in a bit of cheeky damage, which they did a bit in Call of the Archons, but it was more pronounced in Age of Ascension, this just went full bore into stopping you doing what you want to do. One of my favourite new cards from Age of Ascension was Binding Irons, which literally just gives your opponent free chains, which is ridiculous. They had Amber Imp, when a creature reaps, stun it. To be fair, we saw stuff like Zizik Shockworm in Mars that did pretty much the same thing. Except they actually went and took it a step further with Bloodshard Imp. After a creature reaps, its owner must sacrifice it. We saw the key imps that literally said that players were unable to forge a particular key. Now... This could be absolutely broken. So let's say, for instance, you forge your second key and then play a silver key imp. Your opponent cannot forge their second key until they take it down. You already forged, so it doesn't really matter, honestly. Now, Control the Weak was gone from Age of Ascension, but we did see Restring Guntis stay around. Restring Guntis, choose a house your opponent cannot choose it as their active house while Restring Guntis is out. But we also added in Tesmal, and Tesmal came along, and when it reaped, you got to choose a house and essentially just lock your opponent out of that house for the next turn. Now, that was actually limited to two copies per deck. Otherwise, you would just be able to lock your opponent out of a house. And as fun as that was, it actually kind of ruined the game. We saw the really cool weird card Shadow of Dis, which, well, it basically just emptied out enemy text boxes, which was um kind of fun, if I'm honest with you. <laughs> I really enjoyed that one. We had, I mean, it just did some other stuff like Onyx Knight that destroyed each creature with odd power. And to be fair, right, we know that in Call of the Archons, this were all about board wiping, and then they were here very much as well. So we didn't have Gateway to this, but we then had Unlocked Gateway, which was an Omega card that destroyed every creature on the field, and incidentally didn't give you any change like Gateway to this. We saw three fates, which were just destroyed the three most powerful creatures on the board. And all this goes to say that Dis were not shy about trying to get a bit of the old board wiping going. We still had stuff like Lifewood that you sacrifice it and then your opponent cannot play creatures on their next turn. Which, um, it's going to be kind of annoying if you're the one hit by it. And we still had Lash of Broken Dreams, which means that keys cost three more during your opponent's next turn. But we also added in Anguish, who made your opponent's keys cost one more Amber for each damage counter on Anguish. And all this goes to say that what this did was just what they'd always done. They were disruptive. Now, to be fair, it did add in really cool cards like Exhume that let you grab a creature out of your discard pile and actually play it as if it belonged to the active house, which was really kind of fun. But really, Dis just came along to stop your opponent doing what they do. That's what Dis does. And in Age of Ascension, that's what Dis done did. And then we get to Logos. And Logos is a really interesting one for me because when Age of Ascension came out, it really did seem like Logos was one of the weaker houses. It seemed like Logos had taken a huge step back from Call of the Archons where it was one of the best houses. But you'll notice that the top three combinations from Age of Ascension all featured Logos. And frankly... Logos is a very good house. And it kind of carried on what it did in Call of the Archons. Really, there are two things that Logos have always been very good at. Drawing cards and archiving cards. So if we have a look at drawing cards. We didn't have library access. I'll let you decide if you're happy or sad about that. But we did still have Time Traveller. 
draw a couple of cards, get some amber, all good fun. And we still had Library of Babel, which allows you to, well, just once during your turn, you may draw a card. It's pretty gosh darn good. Now, we did lose Mother, which is a little bit sad. Although, to be fair, in the next set, we're getting Daughter. So, you know, what goes around comes around. But we got Professor Sutterkin. And Professor Sutterkin, now it's the kind of card where your opponent is going to go after it as fast as they possibly can if it hits the field. But Professor Sutterkin is one of those burn the witch cards. One of those cards whereby the second it hits the field, your opponent is going to go after it hard. They are going to try and make sure it does not stay on the field for any longer than is absolutely necessary. Because when you read with Professor Sutterkin, you draw a card for each friendly Logos creature. What that means is that if you play four Logos creatures, you get to draw when you read with Professor Sutterkin. Even if the creatures aren't ready, you still get to draw. That's, um, well, that's kind of ridiculous, ladies and gentlemen. It's really, really good. Now we had little things like Phyla the Researcher that drew a card when you placed a creature next to her, which was quite nice. But the point of all of this is we just had really nice options for drawing. And then, of course, we had our archiving options. And archiving might have been even better in Age of Ascension than it was in Call of the Archons. So we had stuff like Master the Theory. If there are no friendly creatures in play, you may archive a card for each enemy creature. And what you do with archiving, basically, is just build up a giant archive, what you can do, of one particular house, and then just have an absolute nuts turn. We had both lab work and sloppy lab work, which were cards that let you just archive from your hand, which worked very nicely indeed. Director of ZYX let you archive, or made you archive, the top card of your deck, now, to be fair, archiving at random can hurt because you end up with a big archive, which means you can have like a nuts untamed turn, but you then end up with a hand clogged full of cards you don't particularly want. And then you're not drawing at the end of your turn and that, that's a little bit sad. We had Titan the Librarian at the end of your turn if Titan Librarian is not on a flank archive a card and that one essentially let you archive as you like and then we had hex beyond whereby when it was destroyed you archive it and the top card of your deck so there was lots of drawing and lots of archiving now the one thing i will say is there was very very little amber control in logos that was the one thing that i think really hurt the house we had cutthroat research which if your opponent had eight amber or more you steal to but even if they had exactly eight you'd bring them down to six and unless you would increase the cost of them forging a key they would still be on check and that was like pretty much the best we had it wasn't ideal but the good news is we had some really cool options. Actually, while we're talking about archiving, I've got to mention memory chip. Let's chuck it in here. Lovely artifact. After you choose logos, your active house, archive a card. But you had stuff like helper bot. When you play it, you can play a non-logos card. You still had wild wormhole that let you play the top card of your deck. You've still got interdimensional graft, which forces your opponent to give you the remaining amber when they forge a key. And bearing in mind, if you know they've got 12 amber, let them forge a key, play this, and there is nothing they can do because they forge a key right at the beginning of their turn and you can force them to give you the amber and there's very little they can do about it. We also saw Binate Rupture, an alpha card. Each player gains amber equal to the amber in their pool. So basically, everyone doubles their amber. But then what you would try and do is pull this off with an interdimensional graft. So your opponent's got, say, 7 amber. You binate rupture them up to 14, but then play an interdimensional graft. And they've got to give you 8 when they forge a key. And even though Logos had very poor amber control, they had lots of draw, lots of archiving, and some really cool other tricks, which made it absolutely worth playing it. And it's why it's become one of the best houses. So there we go. That is the best house combination in Age of Ascension. 
And given that we got a whole bunch of data here, that particular combo's played 5,200 games. That's pretty gosh darn good. One other thing to notice here is that that has, as a combo, played a phenomenal amount of games more than the other combos. I mean, to put this into context, there is no other combination which has played, I think, more than 3,000 games. No, more than 3,500 games. Ah, just about. And this has gone and played over 5,000 it's hard to keep a good win percentage with a high number of games, unless, of course, you just keep winning. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That's the best house combo in Age of Ascension, but I'd like to know what you think about this. So let me know in the comment section. Go nuts and be nice. And then make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel, and follow me on Twitter at the Wossy, where we talk about Keyforge and a whole bunch of other games. And please do make sure you're checking out youtube.com slash Plays, where you can support the channel, get some bonus podcasts, etc. But by far the most important thing as always... Look after yourselves till next time, would you? Thank you very much for watching. My name's Ross, and you've been watching Wassy Plays.